Okay, now we're back. This phenomenal video editing. All right, our next lecture, we're going to be talking about primary and secondary immune diseases. Okay? Primary versus secondary, or primary versus acquired. And as the name would imply, primary, you're born with, they're congenital. Secondary are acquired, meaning you have to be exposed to them. That's the big difference. So there are congenital or primary immunodeficiency diseases that are really difficult to think through. And there are some examples out of the literature that you can pull up. Um, and then acquired. Acquired um, are equally devastating. And the one example that we're going to really dive into on acquired is HIV. Okay? So if we look at the congenital side of things or the primary side of things, we're going to get into a lot of mechanistic trees. Okay? Before you start getting super nervous, don't worry. We'll go through it methodically and carefully. Um, but we will walk down these different lineages and having the background that we've gone through from last unit as well as what we talked about Monday and today on the adaptive immune system will give you some insight because of what you know about B and T cells. And so this is filling out a little bit more of the lineage or the history on B and T cells. So if you look at the slide, um, this is in the bone marrow, this little shaded box. Don't, don't overlook this important detail. This is characterizing this to be in the bone marrow. And if you think back to one of our original lectures on the adaptive immune system, we said that precursor cells that are precursor T cells and B cells all come from the bone marrow. It's that the precursor T cell goes from the bone marrow, it migrates to the thymus, and then it becomes immunocompetent, right? So we're in the bone marrow in this box, and you can see there's a pluripotent stem cell from the bone marrow, right? And this is one of our sources of stem cells if we want to therapeutically go harvest stem cells out of the patient and treat. And a lot of surgeons are doing this today. They'll, they'll do a bone marrow procedure where they access like the iliac crest, and they'll pull out bone marrow, and then they'll isolate stem cells, mesenchymal stem cells that are pluripotent. Well, these, this is normally what happens. These stem cells will become a common lymph, uh, lymphoid precursor, become either a pro-B cell down this pathway, and then we'll go over here next, pro-B cell, a pre-B cell, and then they become immunologically competent in the bone marrow, and they lead to mature B cells that manufacture IgM, IgG, IgA, or IgE. Make sense? That's just that detail. Then you back up to this common lymphoid precursor that comes from the bone marrow. It leaves the bone marrow. And this would be, you could write over, you could put a circle around this, or if you're more artistic, maybe draw like, like a lobule-looking structure and say this is the what? What organ would that be? The thymus, very good. So now the pro T cell came from the bone marrow. In the thymus, it starts to mature, and as it starts to mature, it either becomes a functional CD8 positive T cell or a CD4 positive T cell. Okay, nothing new there. You guys with me? You already knew all that. Did you know all of that in, in exactly that detail? Well, maybe not, but you all knew that, right? We knew where the bone marrow was involved, we knew that the thymus was involved, and we knew kind of the lineage of both of those pathways, okay? So with a primary immune deficiency or a congenital immune deficiency, we get a defect, a single gene defect that hits somewhere in this pathway. So if you look carefully, you'll see these double red squiggly lines in this tree. And you can see that there's quite a few of them that we've identified. All of those are examples of congenital defects. All of those that we know of. And we're discovering more all the time. Okay? So we're going to highlight just a few 
I'm not going to have you memorize every single one, but I want you to understand fundamentally where they come from. I'm right, making sure we can see the screen. All right, so let's talk about a B cell example, and then we'll talk about a T cell example. Um, I'll give you a couple B cell examples, a T cell example, and then I'll give you an example when both happen. Okay? What do you think is more severe? B cell, T cell, or both? Both. Okay? Okay, so let's look at this B cell example first. So the first one is called Bruton disease. So where are we? Um, we're up in the bone marrow, so if I back up, we're just highlighting this, and we're right here. Okay? So we highlight this. If we've got a Bruton disease, which is an X-linked disease, a gamma goblinemia, it's an X-linked disorder, so it's more common in males than in females. It was discovered in 1952. And these patients, what do you think happens? What? No B cells. It's not that complicated, right? There's no B cells. You're absolutely right. Nice job. Do they make any IgG? No. Do they make any IgM? No. Do they make any IgA? Do they make any immunoglobulins? No. So you would get that question on the exam correct, right? You wouldn't be tricked. Well, man, do they make A but not D? They don't make any. Because look, they never get a B cell that matures out of bone marrow. Make sense? Okay, so signs, symptoms, low, absent, B cells and plasma cells. However, they have a normal T cell response. So in these patients, the devil's in the details, but the pre-B cells um, don't differentiate. These pre-B cells never mature. They never become functional. So they, they have B cells, they're just immature because they never made it out of the bone marrow. So it would be wrong to say that they don't have any B cells, they don't have functional mature B cells. Okay, well we're splitting hairs there now and I won't be tricky on the exam like that. I just want you to understand, they don't have the ability to make immunoglobulins because of this disorder. But T cell response is, is, is totally, totally normal. Um, all right, let's get another one on the screen here. Let's look a little bit further down, okay? A little bit further down. So this is where we were with the Bruton disease or X-linked agamogabulemia. And now we're over here at an IgA deficiency. This is an IgA deficiency. And, and the reason that I, I selected this one out of all the ones that I could select, well, the Bruton's is the most severe. And then this particular one is uh, the most common primary immunodeficiency disorder. This is the most common. A lot of times the onset is in um, the late 20s, okay, in patients. And they have selective IgA deficiency, so what ends up happening is because of this point mutation that takes place there, they don't tend to make functional IgA any longer. They made it up until their 20s, and then they stopped making it because of the, um, uh, the, the gene defect that materializes. Uh, so the symptoms that are common are uh, a lot of autoimmune diseases, a lot of um, problems fighting infections. Uh, IgA is associated, remember, with mucosal membranes. So they have a lot of recurrent infections in these mucosal membranes, like sinus infections. Uh, respiratory GI tract infections. Um, <clears throat> let's see what else. Yeah, that's all I wanted to say. Most common, late 20s, problem with IgA. So where IgA is being released is where you're having problems. Okay, <clears throat> let's talk about a T cell deficiency. So now we're over on this side. Remember, this is the globular thymus that you would have drawn. You guys remember that from the bigger diagram? And now we're going to talk about the symptom known as the DeGeorge syndrome. So the DeGeorge syndrome was first described in 1968 by an endocrinologist who was a pediatric endocrinologist named Angelo DeGeorge. And these patients develop with partial or they don't have a thymus at all. 
So, do their T cells ever mature? No. So T cell maturation is compromised. So they don't make functional T cells and they have a problem associated with activity that T cells would normally be responsible for. So both CD8 as well as CD4 positive T cells. Okay, last but not least, let's look at a combined. This is definitely the most aggressive. So if we go further up, so, so we're going further up that original tree, we're in the bone marrow, and we're just below the pluripotent stem cell that leads to pro B cells or pro T cells, and this is called an ADA deficiency, adenosine deaminase deficiency. It's also referred to in the literature as severe combined immunodeficiency disorder, abbreviated SCID, S-C-I-D. These individuals do not manufacture functional B or T cells. These individuals um, only can battle with first line and second line of defense. So they have barriers and they have inflammation, but that's it. Very difficult to exist in the world without functional B or T cells, having an ADA deficiency. Most of these individuals are hospitalized chronically uh, and they have to be contained in a environment. Um, and, and, and just mom or dad, even healthy mom and dad, or siblings visiting, could infect them and, and, and then they could die. They could die from just normal microbial interaction that you and I see every day, okay? The amount of microbes that you and I are experiencing every day, even though that we're not sick, right? Just our bodies just fight it off. You sleep at night, and your immune system is rampantly active. You wake up the next morning refreshed, no infection. Doesn't happen with these patients. Um, so, one second, let me just tell a little bit more, and then we'll get into some, some questions. So, there was, in the 1980s, which probably most of you are too young to remember this, but there was um, a, an individual, a child by the name of David Vetter. And David Vetter uh, was affectionately referred to as Bubble Boy. And they were following a, 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 this the child, and, and and they did like this sixty minute documentary on, on David Vetter, and that's be, that's when the skid ADA uh, deficiency became sort of well understood by the public is with David Vetter or what we call Bubble Boy. And so Bubble Boy disease is another name for the skid disorder because of David Vetter. Okay, question in the back. Ah. Yeah, so that's a great question. The question is kind of leading to the next section that we're about to talk about. And that can someone be infected with HIV if they have um, this particular disorder, ADA deficiency? The answer is likely not. Because the HIV, and we're, we're flashing forward a couple slides, the HIV virus depends upon, uh, it infects the CD4 positive T cell, the helper T cell. So if they don't have any helper T cells, they're good news. They're immune to HIV, right? <laughs> yeah, a lot of other problems, but you know, now we gotta look at the upside. Yeah. Okay. Good question. All right, any other questions about primary immune deficiency disorders? Congenital, make sense? You're born with them, single gene defects. All right, let's talk about secondary in the remaining time. We've got causes, right? We've got malnutrition, stress, cancer, iatrogenic causes. This is a word that um, refers to complications or adverse events because of medical treatment. So if you have a procedure um, that's like chemotherapy, right, because you're fighting cancer, and then you lose a lot of your bone marrow cells because of the chemical toxicity, that's what chemotherapy is, then you might have bone marrow suppression. 
and now all of a sudden you've got this immune problem because you can't generate B and T cells. But it's a secondary cause. It's not that you were born with it because you took medication. Does that make sense? And then infection. So these are absolute causes or examples that we could dive into in detail, but I'm gonna focus on infection because it's probably one of the more interesting ones on the list. But I want you to remember, hit the pause button, hey, malnutrition can be a problem. You can have significant immune suppression because of malnutrition, right? And so patients have to be very careful. So decreasing zinc uptake, for example, that has been shown to deplete B and T cell production. So that's why a lot of these remedies talk about taking zinc, is because you're trying to ramp up B and T cell production. So there is some, there is some uh, mechanistic truth scientifically to some of these more natural supplements that are saying, oh, I'll take zinc before you get sick, or you'll never get sick, right? And I'm not making a promise on that, I'm just saying there is, there is some validity to what they're trying to connect the dots on their story. But what we're going to dive into on this list isn't malnutrition, but I want you to see that is we're going to look at, and we talked about stress, right? We're going to look at HIV. So if we look at chemo, chemo, human immunodeficiency virus, right, a little bit of the history. And so what, what you're looking at here uh, picture-wise is you, you're looking at um, uh, the virus itself. Okay, is enveloped in this layer or this envelope, right? And so it's a reverse transcriptase virus, and it's capsuled by this P24 capsule, this yellow capsule, and then you've got a P17 matrix, which is this blue capsule, and then you surround it with this lipid bilayer. Okay, so this is this is the virus. Probably arose from simian descent um, in about the 1930s and began diversifying. It was first found in humans in 1959 in the Democratic Republic of Congo. Uh, today, the most common venue of transmission is heterosexual activity, uh, but it can be transmitted through any kind of blood contact or IV drug use, or it can be transmitted um, from mother to fetus because of the blood transfer that where it crosses the maternal fetal barrier. Um, the virus itself, there's two different forms, HIV-1 and HIV-2. HIV-1 is the more common of the two. It's isolated in patients in US, Europe, and Central Africa. And HIV-2 is more common in Western Africa. The lipid envelope that we see on this picture, that outer lipid bilayer, that actually comes from the host. And we'll show you, you know, where that happens here in a second. Um, the caspid P24 protein, that P24 protein, caspid is that yellow capsule. That's what you test for when you do an HIV test, is you're looking for that detectable in the blood. Um, high mutation rate, an extremely high mutation rate, a virus core, and it's a retrovirus in nature, meaning it utilizes two copies of RNA uh, to replicate itself. So I am not an HIV expert, so if you have a lot of questions on HIV, I've literally just read to you about all the information I know. And I have to go look it up, but I can't, okay? So what I wanna talk with you is about the pathogenesis. So we'll talk about a little bit more interesting information. I have a link for you. Um, for you guys to look at, and I updated your slides. If you didn't look at it recently, like in the last day, um, then there's just a link that you wanna go download to read this article. I think you'll find it interesting. But what I need to share with you is, HIV utilizes this GP20 protein to bind to the CD4 positive T cell. So here's our virus from our previous picture. You can see the caspid. It utilizes this GP40 linking to this GP20, or sorry, GP120, and then it sits on the CD4 uh, receptor. Goes through a conformational change, and as it goes through this conformational change, it penetrates the membrane and injects this caspid. 
okay? And then it starts replicating. This is the membrane right here. This is the membrane of a CD4 positive helper T cell. Okay. So, so the question in the back is, is HIV actually first infects helper T cells? Okay. Well, there is a receptor known as the CCR5 receptor that's required for this interaction, this docking. And one thing that's quite interesting is there's a population among us that actually are mutants, okay? And they don't express the CCR5 receptor. So they are immune to being infected with HIV, okay? And so this next article is a Nature publication, believe it or not, written by a high schooler. What? Yeah. Yeah, what? You guys thought you were overachievers? You're all underachievers. Okay. So there's a picture of her. Okay. I was playing. I'm just I'm jabbing in, in, in play. But um, this young lady here uh, wrote this article that describes the CCR5 receptor mutation that was first discovered. This is quite fascinating. It was first discovered. Um, it, it, the belief is that it was um, first introduced as a mutation in our population about 700 years ago. Okay. Well before, I told you, 1930s for HIV. 1959, the first human case that was discovered. 700 years predates that. So they think that there may be some connection between the CCR5 mutation that came from a Scandinavian descent, a Viking descent, and there's some parallels between the higher incident of the mutation, the closer you get north to Viking land, and as you move further south in, in Europe, it starts to dissipate. But 700 years ago was when um, Europe was wrestling with the Black Plague. Okay. So a lot of these mutations that take place can occur, and they stick in the population because they're positive mutations. So just fascinating. It had nothing to do likely with HIV, but it's an adaptation that seems to be helping a certain population of patients. And who knows? Maybe there are different therapies that we can design to try to specifically target the CCR5 receptor because it seems to be very functional, okay, successful. All right, so how does the disease progress? So you can read that article on your own. Thought it was kind of interesting. It's a nature publication. It is like a blog from a high school student, but I read through it and I looked up some of the links of the references and it's legit. And I've been reading about the CCR5 and I've been lecturing on it in this class for a while. And so that was, some interesting, you know, easy reading information that I thought you guys might find interesting. Okay, how does it, how does it progress? Well, you can see that the primary infection happens in the blood and in mucosa. You get these CD4 positive T cells that actually are infected. And this moves into the circulation through the lymphatics, and now you have viremia, where you actually get additional copies being made and released. You get the, the latency pay, phase where the virus stays dormant and then later on is going to awaken. And I'll show you a chart here in a second. Um, and then when it comes back on and starts destroying all the CD4 positive T cells, this is when you have the scenario of AIDS, acquired immunodeficiency syndrome, okay? So HIV ultimately leads to AIDS However, the infection is, um, could be years in this cl clinical latency. Could be years in the clinical latency. So, last slide for today to digest. A lot of information here, but we have time in weeks. These little hash marks mean we go from 12 weeks to one year. Does that make sense? So it's not, it's not to scale. That's what these breaks mean in the, in the, in the, in the line, or, or in the uh, legend, or the, What's this called? Access, thank you. Um, CD4 positive T cells here on the x-axis, and then on the second x-axis is the number of copies of the virus, the viremia. So in yellow is the virus, and in blue are your CD4 positive T cells, your helper T cells. So what I want you to see is, at infection, your CD4 positive T cells uh, drop, there's a little bit of a recovery, and then they stay in this cl clinical latency period. The number of copies of the virus jump significantly after about nine weeks of exposure. 
Then it kind of drops and goes dormant for a long period of time. Who knows how long this could be? This could be, it's showing here that it's like 10 years. It could be six months, it could be two years, it could be 10 years. We don't know why some patients, the clinical latency is so long and in others it's very short. We just don't know, okay? But the idea is at some point when the number of copies is aggressive and it comes out of clinical latency, it corresponds to the depth of your helper T cells and that's when your immune system is at its weak point. And so patients do not expire from HIV and they do not expire from AIDS. They expire from opportunistic diseases like the flu or pneumonia or an infection, okay? Um, they, they die because um, they pass because their immune system is compromised and the CD4 positive T cell, which is this linchpin, helper T cell is like the linchpin, it does so many different things. Does that make, it's like the playmaker. It's the one calling the plays. It says, get inflammation going. Start activating B cells to make antibodies. Let's get our cytotoxic T cells going. So that playmaker cell, that linchpin cell, the CD4 positive helper T cell, its population diminishes after a period of time. And that's why these AIDS patients run into problems. Make sense? Okay. Questions? All right, well, have a great weekend. Stay warm. Very cold. Okay, I will see you in like 10 minutes.